today on Facing Life Head On. Hello, I'm Brad Mattis, the host of Facing Life Head On. My usual role is to open the door for you to step into the lives of people who, despite hurdles in their lives, have found the only way to persevere is to face life head on. Today, I want to reintroduce you to some of my favorite stories that shaped this first season of our show. Let's return to our very first episode. Earlier, we met Charnette Missay in her Florida home, happily married and the mother of two, including the son she gave birth to while battling cancer. Charnette is again facing advanced stage breast cancer and recently discovered the shocking news that the abortion she had 15 years before may have caused it. Our quest for answers took us to Dr. Angela Lanfranchi, a New Jersey breast surgeon and clinical assistant professor of surgery. She says one in seven women are likely to get breast cancer, and women who abort a pregnancy are at an even higher risk. So before a full-term pregnancy, 70% of your breast tissue is type 1 lobules. Well, the type 1 lobules are where 85% of all breast cancers start. So what happens is this. In the first two trimesters, you increase, you double in volume your breast type one and two lobules, and that's where cancers start. And then after 32 weeks, when you mature them to the type three, the type three are cancer resistant. So you have the abortion. The higher your risk, because what are you doing? You just are leaving the breast with more places for cancers to start. So it's just a numbers game. Dr. Lamfranchi says that even though the National Cancer Institute isn't talking about the link, people are catching on. Two days ago, I learned that my cancer has metastasized. It's now in both of my lungs. And I'm fighting as hard as I can to spend as much time as I possibly can on Earth with my children. My daughter is only seven, and I wish I could say I'm going to know her when she's 35, so, but I have to take that and I have to oh, use the seven years that I have with my daughter and the four years, I've, three years I've had with my son and just know that that is, in a sense, uh, my life, my fulfillment, my, my joy. What, what advice do you have for women who say that abortion is a quick fix? It's not. It is not. I don't want to be so graphic, but, you know, I've lost my breast, I've lost my ovary, I've lost so many body parts. So how is that a quick fix, you know? It's not. You know, it's like, it's like you're standing in line to have that abortion, you think it's a quick fix, but you don't picture your life 10 years down the road when you finally do have that home, when you finally do have that man you love, when you finally do have that child you want. Look at all that, in a sense, that I lost just because I made that one, that one, in a sense, fatal, fatal decision. My goal is that no other mother will have to stand and hear the words, you're not going to see your child grow up. What message do you have for the abortion industry that say they're helping women? They're not. They're not. You're killing us. You're killing us and you're taking young mothers away from their children. You're possibly taking me away from my children. And that is my message. We have the right to know what our risks are. Just 48 hours before we got to Charnette's home, she found out the cancer had spread to other parts of her body. The battle ahead for Charnette is going to be tough, but she hasn't given up. I was able to catch up with Charnette and find out how she and her family are doing now, almost a year later. 
They vacationed in Disney World over Christmas. Her son Christian and daughter Gabriel had a magical experience. Gabriel celebrated her eighth birthday in January and Charnette was by her side to welcome in another year. Charnette's love for dance is still strong and Gabriel is following in her footsteps. The mother-daughter duo performed at Beautiful in Pink. It's a facet of Charnette's Embrace Life campaign focusing on women with breast cancer and bringing awareness to women not diagnosed. Charnette continues to beat the odds through her sheer joy for life and seeing the beauty in each new day. If you have a personal story about breast cancer you'd like to share with Charnette, you can email her through our website at facinglife.tv. When we return, we'll recap Jackie Rabin's journey from unexpected paralysis to unanticipated walking, all with a little help from her own stem cells. Welcome back. Today we're looking back at the stories that define what facing life head-on truly means. We talked with Jackie Raven, who as a teenager found out she was paralyzed from the waist down after a car accident. Jackie traveled to Portugal for a highly specialized surgery, where doctors took stem cells from her nose and placed them in her spine. Two weeks later, Jackie began walking in braces. So the thought is that they take adult stem cells mm -hmm. from your own body mm -hmm. and put them on the injured spine yeah. and then your cells wouldn't reject yeah. the adult it's my stem own cells. cells. Right. And the hope was to regenerate the cells and get them working in my spine again. When did you notice a difference? Like gradually I noticed how I had more hip movement and how feelings started feeling different. Like if somebody touched my leg or something, I could like feel more of that they, where they touched me and stuff. It's probably, I don't know how long after the surgery, about probably like a month. Dr. David Prentice is a senior fellow for life sciences at the Family Research Council's Center for Human Life and Bioethics. He is an internationally recognized expert on stem cell research. Dr. Prentice says too much attention is given to embryonic stem cell research which has yet to treat or cure anyone. It's adult stem cell research that's proven successful. Let's be clear, when we talk about adult stem cells, you don't have to be 21 to own an adult stem cell. We're born with those cells in our tissues and organs. They're in umbilical cord blood. They're in placenta. Essentially, anything from birth onward counts as an adult stem cell. Now, have there been recent breakthroughs regarding adult stem cell research? Well, I think one of those has been in terms of spinal cord injury for patients like Jackie, where Carlos Lima has now got his peer-reviewed publication accepted and published, uh, the first one actually to show adult stem cells successfully benefiting patients that have had a spinal cord injury. We basically have shown that these adult stem cells are just as flexible and just as useful as embryonic stem cells but without the negatives of tumor formation or getting the wrong cell type. Dr. Prentice says adult stem cell treatments have fewer problems because cells are the patient's own. Jackie's grateful for the chance stem cell research gave her to walk again, but she says she draws the line with embryonic. You would have rejected embryonic stem cell research. I would have had a problem with that. Why? because I don't think I need to harm somebody else or kill somebody else to help myself. That's just, that just seems wrong to me. Jackie's taking her message worldwide. Shortly after this interview, she was scheduled to speak to groups in Washington, D.C. and Ireland. I recently learned Jackie is doing great. She's walking longer distances with the help of a walker and leg braces. Jackie is still standing strong on adult stem cell research. Her story was shared multiple times on the U.S. Senate floor during the stem cell debates. Jackie also traveled to Ireland where she shared her first-hand knowledge of the progress found in adult stem cell implantation. Jackie's mom said, I'm so proud of her determination, strength, and faith. She truly is an inspiring young lady. And indeed, she is. Often your plan for life doesn't turn out as expected. It was once said, Life is what happens after you've already made plans. 
Barbara Curtis understands the tremendous blessings unplanned events bring to the table. We took our cameras to Waterford, Virginia, where we met the Curtis family, a very large family. Parents Tripp and Barbara are raising 12 kids, four of which have Down syndrome. Their special journey first began when baby number eight was born. When they handed Johnny to me in the delivery room, they swaddle the baby in blankets and everything and they give it to you. You just see this little face peeking, peeking out of blankets. And Tripp and I were going, looking at him in wonder and everything. And I said, oh Tripp, he doesn't look like the other babies, does he? He's a little bit different. Because we would always compare and say, oh, well, who does this one look like? And, and uh, I said, look at his, his eyes are a little slanted. And look, oh, his back here is a little heavy on his neck. And I think because the doctor heard me, he would, they were, the doctor and nurse were still down there doing all the cleanup and everything. Um, and now that I think back on it, there was a very hushed, it was very quiet in the room. My doctor came up and put his hand on this shoulder and the nurse came and put her hand on the other shoulder. I don't know what they thought I was gonna do, but um, my doctor said, I have some hard news for you. And I said, he has Down syndrome, doesn't he? And my doctor said, yes. And I said, well, that's okay. I always told you it would be. And I remember feeling, I get chills even when I think about it, this tremendous feeling of exhilaration, like God must love me so much. As though I were at the top of a roller coaster and I just about to start this incredibly wonderful journey. I can't explain that. I can't say, oh, Barbara Curtis just really had her act together or had just this wonderful heart. Somehow God had prepared a place in my heart for this child. Tripp and Barbara began to consider adopting children with Down syndrome after baby number nine, Madeline, joined her big brother, Johnny, in the family. So they were growing up together. They were kind of like twins because Down syndrome children develop a little more slowly. So they actually learned to walk at the same time and did everything together. It was just a wonderful relationship and it still is to this day. But at some point I realized that it would be nice for Johnny to have somebody who would grow up with him at his pace. And so we began to look for a child to adopt with Down syndrome. And in 1995, we found um, Jesse who we adopted and that was the end of my plan <laughs> but that wasn't the end of God's plan and twice since then people have asked us to adopt children with Down syndrome so we've ended up with four total boys with Down syndrome. There's Johnny the oldest of the pack then Jesse the first to be adopted Daniel the quiet one and Justin the charmer. Barbara what are some of the common misconceptions about raising children with Down syndrome? Through your hard work and efforts, you can make your child learn how to do all the things and accomplish all the things that you want them to do. Among my four children with Down syndrome, they run the gamut in intelligence. Um, Jesse is pretty nonverbal. Inside, in the house? Okay, then go in the house, honey. Um, Johnny's 14 and he still can't read, but you know what? Johnny's not interested in learning to read, which is why he doesn't learn how to read. He'd rather learn all the words to Phantom of the Opera and cook nachos and do all kinds of other things that he does. Um, Daniel reads maybe 300 words at the age of 10, but he's not as socially gifted as Johnny. So what you find is that there is no Down syndrome template. There's no there's no um, stereotypical Down syndrome person that they're all individuals and yes we can help them reach their potential but their potentials are going to be different. I asked Barbara for an update on the boys. She told me they're involved in basketball and equestrian riding. All four boys traveled to Washington DC to act in a play at the Smithsonian. Barbara has also been busy writing insightful updates about family life and publishing two new books, both of which you can check out on her website by logging on to FacingLife.tv. When we come back, we'll revisit the Hanselmans, who made history in Ohio by choosing life.
Today we're taking time to recap the shows that brought the pulse to facing life head on. Often these stories are about people like you who are living with zest and pressing forward. Imagine being told something really great is coming your way. Then they pull the rug out from under you. Doctors say you may die if you choose to hold on to your dream. This is what happened to Keith and Jennifer Hanselman, except it wasn't imagined. The reality was a life or death situation. Keith and Jennifer Hanselman's sex tuplets made history. The first to be born in Ohio and the first in the nation to be completely healthy. They were headed home just weeks after birth. We did a lot of planning on this. We had met for months to plan how to have everybody available to care for the babies. And that just went off seamlessly. So you brought, within a matter of weeks, short weeks, six preemie babies into your home. Yes. yes. What was that like for you? It was a blur. It was a big blur. The kids came home one at a time over the course of three weeks, so we got a chance to get to know each one. We were kind of worried we wouldn't be able to tell them apart because they had no fat when they were that little. They had absolutely no fat, and so they all looked a lot alike. But um, just bringing them home one at a time gives us a chance to sort of get to know them and get acquainted with their little quirks and things like that. When did you start to see their personalities come out? I would say at birth. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely at birth. You. Yeah, Sophie was our, our smallest, and you could definitely tell she was a fighter and was not going to take um, no from anyone, and you know, whatever she wanted, she was going to get, and she's, she still kept that personality. Isabella was our firstborn, and she was a diva then, and she's a diva now. She definitely wants the attention on her, and Lucy was always very quiet, and she's still quiet, but she's gotten to be more of the, the mother hen of the pack. Then there's Kyle, the snuggler, Logan, the flirt, and Alex, the future engineer. Now when you consider with everything that you've been through and you go back to that day when you were broached with the option of selective reduction or abortion of some of the babies, what goes through your mind now? It scares me to think that we even pause to think about it because I can't even imagine what life would be like without one of the kids. I can't even imagine who we would have chosen to yeah. get rid of, you know, it just, it still really bothers me to think that we could have lost some of them. You know, we could have listened to what he said, we could have listened right. to the doctor and made a choice to get rid of some of these kids and I can't even imagine who we would live without now. It's a tough thing, you have to think about what you can live with in your heart for the rest of your life. And for us, we knew that we couldn't live with it if we got rid of some of our kids. So, through all the babies spit up, the dirty diapers, the sleep deprivation, was it all worth it? Absolutely.